All right, I'm Professor Mainu M. Pim, and coming back to you with the classical African civilization of ancient Kush, uh, part three. So we've done one and two, and there's been a lot of responses to part two, and I addressed some of the questions in uh, Facebook, but for part three, I'll show some new insight about my ongoing field work in the Nile Valley in the Northeast African region, but also to address some of the questions as well that have been coming in. And uh, so this is part of the Africana study series on ancient Kush. So I've been focusing on and, and coined the term Kushology, which is a systematic focus on the civilization of ancient Kush. And I've been doing the work in the field now in that region for 30 years. And so for the last 13 years, there's been a, a concentrated focus more and more on ancient Kush and its origins. So the area of Kushology is an emerging field. And I will point out, as I did in the previous, the previous parts of this series, some of the early pioneers, but the new work that now is emerging and that must be done and completed if we're gonna know about the antiquity of Kush and really understand the origins and the foundations. And this has to do with really reconstituting as much as possible an understanding of the African customary system, the tradition, the beliefs that had to do with a, a region-wide commonality of cultures. These cultures are different, but yet there's an overriding unity that links them together. And it's what Chancellor Williams in his book, The Destruction of Black Civilization, calls the African constitutional system, where you have this, uh, this overriding commonality in terms of how they approach culture. So whether it's the, the laws, the, the legal system, the, uh, the, the rites of passage, how they um, transition in, from one age grade to a next, to the next to the, the, their idea of the cosmos and the creator or warfare. Uh, but the institutions, you see a, a, an overriding connection and unity. So it's, it's, it's a culture that clearly there was, there is, and there always has been this overriding overlapping of the cultures, even as they're separate and different and unique, but there's uh, so much similarity and commonality. And the way to understand that is to, to continue to do the ongoing systematic field research. And that's what's drew me to the region now for decades. So I continue the work. So part three is just a, a continuation of what I've been sharing in terms of the field work. And we may even have a part four, but right now we want to show you just a little bit more of the work that continues to be uh, in the area that I call Kushology, study of the classical African civilization of ancient Kush. So I'm going to show some uh, slides to give you uh, some perspective of what the work is really about in the field. And so you get a, uh, a clear idea of what it is that I'm uh, presenting and uh, to put you in the field as much as possible to understand the, the uh, significance of Kush. And it's not just looking at ancient Kush, but it's the ongoing living cultures, the living traditions that give us insight about not only these current practices, but it gives us a window into the past. And that's what's so rewarding about the, the fieldwork research. And make no mistake about it, there is nothing more important than primary research or first-hand research. So this is what I do. This is my vocation. It's not an occupation. It's my vocation. And so documentation beats conversation every day of the week. So this is why Kushology has been at the top of the list because uh, uh, as Chancellor Williams indicates, we go back into antiquity and we find a ready-made, highly developed civilization. And it's not just about knowing the past only, it's about understanding the past and, and helping us to clarify the present so we can chart a path for the future. And that's what it's about. It's about looking at what made Africans great in the old days. What were the principles and practices that allowed them to sustain civilizations that confound the world? that have existed for millennia. It's those principles, it's those practices, it's the foundations of African greatness that we have to, to seek to understand. And as a historian, my goal is to help us recover from historical amnesia and to, uh, to use that foundation as we move forward. 
So, so again, it's about looking at ancient Kush and Kushology. So, so some questions that I'm answering as I also share some new aspects of my work that I didn't show in part two. So it's all about ancient Kush and the study of this classical African civilization. So as I've mentioned, my book, The History of African Civilizations, is what I use in my course at Contra Costa College here in California. And it came out last year, so you can certainly purchase the book by uh, going to my website, mainewmpim.com. You can purchase a copy there. But I have some of the information that I'm sharing in this series. But there's much more to always present. And uh, I look forward to publishing my comprehensive work in the very near future from the ongoing field research. So as I've discussed in the previous parts of the series, there's some early pioneers in the field of Kushology. And uh, the name Ethiopia was, was uh, given to the Kushites or to ancient Kush by the foreign group, the Greeks, when they came in. So when you read about ancient Ethiopia, or at least Ethiopia in antiquity, going back thousands of years, people are typically referring to Kush or the civilization of ancient Kush. So there's pioneers like William Leo Hansberry. Hansberry is one of the pioneers in the field and he is uh, somebody who did not write. So he had uh, field research notes, he read Greek, he read Latin, so he read original documents. And Hansberry being a pioneer in the field of uh, looking at uh, uh, ancient Kush, he presented this to his students at Howard University. So in 1922, William Leo Hansberry actually created the African Civilization section of the history department. And back at that time, he was not respected by his colleagues at Howard University. This is a historically black institution, but yet people ridiculed Hansberry. But he, he made an indelible imprint that he was so far ahead of the people around him and looking at African civilizations is that he knew more than his professors. This is why it was difficult for Hansberry to even get a PhD. So he did not write, however. So later, one of his students, Joseph Harris, he collected the research notes and the lecture notes of his teacher, William Leo Hansberry, and he wrote the William Leo Hansberry African History Notebook One, and then this is volume two, Africa and Africans as seen by so-called classical writers. And this is in, uh, so this goes back uh, to the early 20th century, pretty much a century ago. Then Drusilla Dungey Houston, also writing in the 1920s. She wrote multiple books, and the title is The Wonderful Ethiopians of the Ancient Kushite Empire. So here it is out of Oklahoma. She wrote one of the, the uh, tremendous stories about the ancient people of Kush and their, their influence, not only in the region of uh, Northeast Africa, but across the Red Sea, and it's extending into the East. And then there's Later, the work of the pioneer uh, John G. Jackson, Ethiopia and the Origin of Civilization. And this is one of the pamphlets that John G. Jackson wrote. He, um, he also, in his writings over the years, he wrote many other books like The Ages of Gold and Silver or Introduction to African Civilizations. And he's always prioritizing Kush or Ethiopia as a foundation civilization. And so this word Ethiopia is a Greek word uh, and it means something around black face, burnt face, or kissed by the sun, a man with a sunburnt uh, skin. And, and that's pretty much, so the Greeks were definitely influenced by uh, color. And that's why they, they call the place Ethiopia and the people Ethiops. But the word Kush, we don't know the meaning of Kush, but clearly that is the oldest name. That's the original name that was applied to the area. So we discussed that uh, before. And also the most prominent student of William Leo Hansberry is none other than Dr. Chancellor Williams, and he's had the biggest influence on my primary research because Chancellor Williams was a researcher's researcher. Literally, he pointed the way as he took the lessons of his teacher, William Leo Hansberry, and he went to study in, uh, in the footsteps of, um, of Hansberry, and he began to do research in libraries and, and even attend classes at Oxford in order to learn from colonial historians who had all of the negative things to say about Africa, but as they presented propaganda, they often revealed the very nature of an early African democracy in this constitutional system, this, this customary system of, of uh, practices, ideas, and, uh, and, and it was Williams that 
understood that this philosophy was not anything that was other than a early form of democracy, a government run of the people, for the people, by the people. And Chancellor Williams went in the field in the 1950s doing pioneering research as a primary researcher, where he went to 26 nations and did work among 105 different language groups. And in his classic book, The Destruction of Black Civilization, Chancellor Williams is the one that lays out step by step what is the what should be a game plan for future uh, historians. And that's what he discusses, the importance of field research and why this is at the top of the, the field. If you're really serious about uh, being a scholar and that what future historians should do uh, in the field of, of, uh, of Africa. Uh, excuse me, of African studies. So he said he only scratched the surface, but there's more work to be done, but clearly a pioneer and as he lays out his work. So I'd mentioned and discussed that before those contributions. Here's the map that we created with uh, the Save Nubia project. And it's about a 4,000 year old, a uh, 4,000 BCE or 6,000 years ago. This is pretty much what the map would look like in terms of uh, ancient Kush and its influence and the environment that the Kushites influenced. So the heartland of ancient Kush, as you see, is the northern part of Sudan. This area here, this vast area, this is where the kings ruled from. This is where they built the Great Pyramids. There's over at least 223 pyramids and counting as work continues to be done in the region. So they, they not only built the mighty pyramids, and there's twice as many pyramids in Sudan as there is in Egypt. This is where they built the mighty temples many of the Amun temples to the god Amun or Amun. Uh, this is where they built colossal statues. This is where they built extensive burial uh, sites. This is where the, the Kushites, they left their greatest remains right here in the heartland. This is where they ruled from. And these are clearly Africans from the Southern region. And they came from the South and they built uh, monuments and they built a culture that has stunned people. But what's amazing about this, this is just an upper layer. This is the top layer. This is the newer layer of Kushite uh, contributions in the, in the region. But to go back to its origin, we got to look below, beneath the surface and go further south to look at the origin and foundation of ancient Kush. So it was the Kushites that ruled from this area, but they had a vast influence that was not only in the northern part of Sudan, but going all the way down to uh, Egypt into the Mediterranean area. So yes, it's down north in this area and up south. So it's the influence of Kush, whether it was current day Egypt, current day Sudan, which was the heartland, South Sudan and, 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 and Ethiopia. This is the area that we're gonna find the origins and the foundation and also the current cultural practices that continue the ancient Kushite tradition. This is why the entire region is important from Somalia, Djibouti, Eritrea, and certainly across the Red Sea into Saudi Arabia and Yemen. And as the more work that I'm doing in the field of Kushology, then I'm drawn further and further to the south, to Kenya and definitely to Uganda. And I'll mention Uganda a little bit later. And you see the inset here, the general region that we're looking at in the Northeast Africa area, as we zero in on the foundation and origins of uh, the classical African civilization of ancient Kush. This is the essence of Kushology, being able to, to know and understand and document the fullness of the history and go back to the earlier period and not just looking at Kush in his later phases as almost everyone does because the work requires that we go to the south and look at the much earlier periods. So what I've been concentrating on over the last 13 years is this area here that you see on the map. Now, I've been doing field work for 30 years, for three decades in the Nile Valley region uh, after I've done the work in, in museums institutes, libraries, and that which is a important prerequisite to doing the field work. And I learned that from Chancellor Williams many years ago, that you have to do the work in the museums, at archives, libraries. Uh, Chancellor Williams did work in the libraries. I understood it wasn't only the libraries, but the museum work has to be done because there are millions of stolen African artifacts. And that's why I started to work in museums in 1989 when I went through all throughout Europe and, uh, and did work in the museums there and began to study the artifacts and then, and then doing work in the libraries before I began to do the field work in Africa. So I was, uh, I had lived in Europe, literally, 
or for a year in 89 and 90 to go to all of the places that had stolen these uh, artifacts. And um, so I first started to do work in the Nile Valley in 1990, 30 years ago after I did pioneering work in all the museums, institutes, and libraries in Europe that had stolen African artifacts. So I lived in London and I went to East Germany, West Germany, and all of the other places. Uh, uh, now they're one Germany, Austria, Italy, Spain, France, Belgium, Holland, Denmark, and Sweden, and then began to do the work in the Nile Valley of, of, of going to pyramid sites, temple sites, tomb sites and ancient residential sites to be able to systematically examine these ancient sites uh, on the uh, on the continent. So so it's all the ancient areas and archaeological sites where that must be carefully examined and explored, documented, and, and there must be a careful uh, examination of all of the details, but that's crucial. But going to the south is not as many artifacts as we begin to leave the place of Kemet or Egypt and begin to go up south. Now, the work requires the ongoing field work among the living cultures, the ongoing living practices and ceremonies and rituals, and, and spending time in these living communities who are in remote areas, isolated areas in many cases. And that helps the modern researcher like myself because the cultures have largely remained intact because they're not influenced by the, by the, silly, the uh, city dwellers or the highlanders as they talk about people in these high areas and city environments that they don't really relate to very much. And, but it's spending time among the city uh, the the uh, the ongoing cultural uh, elements and, and and practices and really spending time in those areas and among those people and learning from the, the 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 chiefs and the elders and the priests and the cultural practitioners and those special heroes and warriors that are among them that have the highest status because of their deeds that have helped the local community. And um, so the cultural observations and, and, and studying the cultural ways, there's nothing more important than that. And that's why this region has been important. It's a vast region, a huge, vast re region, but this gives us the perspective about the ongoing cultural practices and beliefs and philosoph uh, philosophies that relate to the civilization of ancient Kush and as an overriding unity that links these different groups. So I mentioned in, in uh, the last part of the series that there's a lot of misrepresentation. I mentioned the Louvre Museum in Paris that they misidentify, grossly misidentify images of uh, antiquity because they don't know. And I mentioned uh, a relief in the Louvre Museum, but also as some of you who've looked at part two, you've looked at what I showed in terms of the tomb of Wormhead. And in the tomb of Hormheb in Kemet, or you know it as ancient Egypt, the same thing. <clears throat> Here's Hormheb, you know, same thing in terms of misrepresentation. Here is Hormheb receiving, receiving the gold collars. This is a lifetime achievement award, very high official, general in the army, who later becomes the leader of the, of the nation itself. And he is receiving his rewards. And you see the assistants here giving him his, his due, his respect. So the gold collar. It's one of the most special awards that a person could receive in classical Kemet. And, but most, most importantly, I showed you these scenes because you have a, uh, a group of, of uh, men who are not from Kemet, they're from another place, and this image here. So typically people would misidentify them and uh, or say that they're Nubians, they're not Nubians. What we know, uh, as we mentioned, we'll discuss Nubia and his greatness in another part of the series on, on Nubia in the very near future. But what's important here is that we don't have to just say that these are Southerners or these are people from the, Nine, the Nilotic region, you know, in the whole Nile Valley, the, the Nilotic people or foreigners or people to the South. We can look at the cultural elements, the cultural details. And as you recall, I indicated the cultural markings or the so-called scarification. And you can see the artist here, the sculptor, is very clever. And this is actually in ruins. Can you imagine when this, when this uh, relief of these five men 
when this was completed and how it actually looked before it was damaged. But what we're looking at it is in its damaged state, but it's still, even so, it is still an image that can clearly be seen where the artist shows the cultural markings, or you know the scarification. Notice that there is um, the lines across the forehead indicating that it is a fresh cut and there's still some blood showing. So you can see the marks, one, two, three, four, five, and it looks like a sixth one here is, is somewhat, somewhat healed. But this one, this person, his cuts are fresh. Then if you look at the man behind him to the left, he too has the traditional six cuts across the forehead and not quite as red because his cultural markings are, are, in, are healing faster. And then you see the man on the left as well, the far left, you can see these are fresh cuts. So the artist is very perceptive in showing that there are different phases of healing. And the man second from the right, you can see the, the lines across the forehead, but they have largely healed. And this is what the, the, uh, this is what the artists are showing here. And if you take a look at the hairstyle, this is a classic hairstyle, yes, from the, from, from the South. We can definitely look at these cultural details, look at the loop earring of the man there, second from the right. We can look at these details and begin to, to not only pinpoint the region, but also the actual group that this would represent by the cultural markings. And um, that's what's significant here. So these are new air from South Sudan, as I indicated, uh, by the cultural markings. And so when we read books by so-called experts who mislead the public, they don't know anything about African culture, but yet they write these books on Kush that have nothing to do with the, uh, the, the visual details, right? And so this is an example here. So I was showing this in order to indicate that that's what the field work allows us to do is to become more specific and more accurate as we look at these people who would represent the early period of the art and to really look at the foundations, the origins of the, uh, the Kushite civilization. And we know there's a significant amount of high level development and important, uh, you know, important details from the Southern part, from the Southern lands, but the work just hasn't been done. So here's a modern image <coughs> of a new era. It's the classic, cuts across the forehead to link the person to their group. This also takes place as a result of making it very clear that the person now is moving into manhood. So it's really about the initiation from boyhood into manhood. And these are the classic images and marks of a person who are new air, as you saw, ancient, and now you see modern as well. So there's no doubt about uh, what we're looking at and which group it represents. So South Sudan is a very special place and there's not been anywhere near enough work that has been done in the area in order to look at the current practices. And, uh, you know, it's like an un these are unwritten practices and philosophies and beliefs. And, um, and in this case, cultural markings <clears throat> that help us to link the past and the present, but it requires <clears throat> extensive field work to be able to put the whole story and the whole puzzle together. And so the marks are distinctive. This is the marks, classic marks of a Dinka. And this, you know, it looks like it's four marks on either side and it represents the cattle horns. This is us, uh, it's about cattle culture. That's what gives people their, their status, not currency, but the, the amount of cattle that someone has. And the Dinka, their cultural markings is quite distinctive. Now, you know, the Dinka and Nuer, there's certainly a common origin if we go back far enough. So sometimes you might have a little overlap, but this is the classic Dinka uh, scarification or the cultural markings here. And um, so when the Herodotus, the Greek writer is discussing and talking about the tallest people and the best looking people in the world. Well, even now the Dinka are, are as a group, the tallest people in the world. And, um, but there has been some recent challenges. And so the, the Dinka, uh, in, in, one, in some studies, they are not quite as tall as they have been, but they're absolutely very tall. And, you know, because of uh, 
now lower in nutrition, given some of the political issues, but they're the tallest people in the world. So when we look at Herodotus, we get a another important clue as to who he is referring to, who's being referred to in the region. When and you know, it's amazing that the uh, the foreigners, the Greeks, said that it was the Ethiopians, or in other words, those people of Cush, that were the tallest. But not only that, but the best looking people in the world. Most people think they're the best looking, but the Greeks didn't think that. So they said that this group is. And so if we're talking about height, then uh, we must look at the Dinka. And this is, gives us a clue as to who this ancient writer was talking about. Even though he came around thousands of years later, you can see the utmost respect of Herodotus, the Greek historian. Now going to South Sudan, very special. Um, and um, so I was able to spend time in, in, uh, in Juba, the capital, and the Sud Institute has been doing uh, important ethnological research in the area. There's so many different groups that practice their traditional cultures, not necessarily in the city. So we have to go outside of the city to go to rural areas, to go to isolated areas, to go to the villages where the practices, the ideas, the traditions, they have not really changed very much. So at the Sioux Institute, so when I was there, I had, uh, on the left, my little, uh, uh, my joke, sorry, my joke, he's, he's on the left, a good thinker brother, he was was uh, very gracious to make sure that my uh, my understanding and research in the area last year was very um, fruitful and effective. So little joke is um, classic uh, Dinka. And I'll tell you more about some of his work in linguistics. And uh, to, my, to the right there is uh, General Angelos, who was uh, very helpful um, in his uh, experience and work in the area. Uh, so you know, very vital, uh, these two brothers, in help, helping to make sure that the research was productive. I look forward, look forward to going back and continuing to work in the uh, different areas of South Sudan. And then uh, to the right of uh, General Angelos is Professor Joke, who works in the field of anthropology. Um, and he uh, he's done you know some work a lot of work on the ethnological uh, traditions and cultures of the people there in South Sudan. So I was in very good hands in spending time in South Sudan. And many people they haven't gone to South Sudan because they hear about different rumors and so forth. But that doesn't make any sense. This is one of the most important um, areas of my research, and I look forward to going back and spending time with these Dinka brothers and their great hospitality because they know that I'm coming to assist, to help, to learn from them, but also to share insight about the, the ancient tradition that continues with the living cultures among the Dinka and others. And so their uh, brotherhood is invaluable. Um, and this is the Sioux Institute. Now here's Maju, uh, Alul Majok. He is now sharing with me, we were discussing some of his work, and this is what he calls the Nidalarian script. So in the Nile Valley there, the indigenous groups um, there, they continue with their cultural practices, their ideas, their, their beliefs, their philosophies. So Alumajok, what he is presenting is what he has termed a Nidalarian script because there in the Nile Valley, they use you know, indigenous plants and animals for different parts of their life ways. And he's taken 223 of these different images and is creating a, an actual script in the Nile Valley with these indigenous groups. So he's been working on this project for two, since 2010. And we were discussing the different elements of uh, his script. So this is just one example of the important ongoing work that's being done in the area. And and he also has a whole uh, cultural uh, framework and apparatus to have ongoing cultural festivals to highlight the significance and the importance of the rituals and ceremonies of the various groups. So uh, this brother was, you know, very helpful and valuable in his uh, his work over the past decade. And so when we look at, for example these images from ancient Kemet, then when I'm in South Sudan, I'm able to learn at an accelerated level because they know their culture, and but I know the ancient images 
and inscriptions and details. And so we are comparing notes and ideas and experiences. And I'm asking uh, them, you know, to uh, ask the elder here, what does he think about the images? And it's amazing the kind of insight that the elders give when they look at images like this because the elders have never seen them before. But what they know, they know themselves, they know their own culture, and they know the rituals, the ceremony, the dress, the appearance, the attire, that is what they know. So when I'm showing them images literally from several thousand years ago, it's amazing insight that they give as they look to help identify the ancient people in the region. So there's no need then to just continue to say that these are Southerners or these are Nilotic groups in a general way, but to particularly pinpoint and be specific about which particular group or subgroup the people represent. Take a look at the images here. They're jet black. You just saw the pictures. The brothers are jet black and the sisters, uh, many of them. I mean, literally, completely jet black, beautiful color. And you take a look at these images, same, same thing. So these are, these are, this is a series of men and there's two women behind them. But take a look, these are high level individuals. And we know that because of uh, the beautiful art, but even more directly, look at the ostrich feather on their heads. These are chiefs from different groups. So this is an image of, a, of, a, of chiefs representing groups in a regional area. It's not just one um, person representing one group, but this is a group of chiefs representing the uh, regional leaders. And that's what you see here. And notice that, and we know that because of the fact that they have on different kind of loincloths. You see this? This one in the front is linen, and the other ones represent different uh, colors of uh, like cow hide, for example, you know, animal hides. And you can see that there's variation in all five of these men. This is the indication that they're not the same group. They're uh, part of a regional group of people. So, but however, Take a look here. We also can get some specific ideas because you have groups and then you have subgroups. Like I was mentioning, think of their subgroups of the Dinka. It depends on which particular location they live in, even now. But they're all a Dinka, but they're subgroups. Uh, and so take a look. You have the loop earrings. There's the almond shaped eyes for all of them. And not only that, but take a look at the hairstyle. This hairstyle, well, why would jet black people have that color hairstyle, you might ask? Well, this is because they are so close to the, to the cows, to the cattle. You see, you saw the scarification or the cultural markings. They're very close to the cattle. So the whole culture, it, it integrates the cattle into it. And so what they use is, is, is the cow urine. The cow urine turns the hair this color. Yeah, so that's, that's, and that's what they do even now. And, uh, and then they have that kind of hairstyle where the hair is kind of cut back. A little bit and that's what you you see almost like a mop kind of but that's a classic hairstyle in antiquity but it continues today there's a linkage here of how people have not changed very much so this gives us an a uh, insight about the different groups and who they represent then you see the women here in the black in the back here you have a woman here who's black and there's one in the back who's brown in color so you do have groups that are not always completely jet black in skin tone but there's variations of colors, but uh, black is overwhelmingly the dominant color. And look, look at the children here, black and, black and brown, behind the two women. And then here's a child you see above. But this kind of image, now we can gain more insight. And this is why the field work is absolutely uh, crucial to know about these uh, customary practices because it relates to old Kush. Now we have to put the pieces together as I'm beginning to do as uh, we continue to work of Kushology and moving that discipline to the next level. So you see scenes like this. Here you have, again, these men from the same area. So this is why South Sudan is so important and crucial in that entire region. And here you have four chiefs. Notice the black and brown colors of their skin tone. The man is bringing a lot of gold. Three is plural. So he's got three and then another three, indicating a lot of gold. And there is a lot of gold in the region, lots of gold. I mean, there's a gold rush for example, in Sudan, companies rushing in, individuals going to work in these gold mines. When you're traveling out in the rural isolated areas, uh, areas a lot of times you'll see lights and you'll see uh, some kind of 
structure and activity. It looks like a town until you get really close and it's nothing more than a mining area. Uh, but that's but they're huge operations because there's a lot of gold in the area. So take a look. Again, you have the loop earrings. Notice the jewelry around the neck, the linen outfits. He's got the distinctive hairstyle again and, uh, and the ostrich feather. So we can then, again, um, hone in on who the people are. So why the ostrich feather? Notice the leopard skin outfit as well. So these men bringing these, uh, these items, these gifts, this is important information to know who they are, where they come from, and specifically which group or subgroup. And that's really what the uh, field work allows us to do is to be able to make a, a, an exact match. It's detective work, folks, is what it's about, to learn more about the significance of Kushology. And, you know, so like these groups in the South, they use the uh, cow urine. There's other groups in the Southern Ethiopia area, like the Karo, they, uh, they use red ochre. In the hammer, they use red ochre to, to have their hair like a reddish color. And so they, uh, they alter the color of their hair in different ways. And these are cultural practices that go back to antiquity as you can see here. And so one of the things that drew me to the region, as I said before, is the, uh, is the pursuit of, of trying to find out why it is the ostrich feather, the ostrich, why that bird, and why the feather representing the highest possible law. This is the goddess Ma'at, as you can see, with the ostrich feather on her head to represent an important symbol. And here's her name. Her name is Ma'at, the goddess Ma'at, and she is the daughter of Ra daughter of God. And the text says that, that Ra, the creator, um, the firstborn of Ra was Ma'at. Ma'at represents the law, truth, justice, righteousness, harmony, balance. But if you look at Ma'at as a whole, it's the elevated notion of moral perfection. That's what it means. So if we go back to Kemet, we go back several millennia, many millennia, going back, you know, you can go back to the beginning of the nation, go back 5,000 years, and you see Ma'at at the root of the culture, of the civilization. And so they chose an ostrich feather and they chose a woman to give you an idea of the high level status of women throughout the entire period. So they've always had high status and there's something special about the ostrich feather. And that's why I wanted to go and pursue um, knowledge of that because I was quite aware that people continue to use the ostrich feather to represent the highest level individuals in the society. So not only in South Sudan, but I spent a lot of time in the Southern nations, nationalities, and peoples region of Ethiopia. And this is uh, in the Southwest region. It's a special area with over 40 different indigenous groups in this area. So it's a special region that's been earmarked by the Ethiopian government. And this is a vast region of groups that have not changed their cultural ways very much at all. Even in the 21st century, we still can learn and observe their customary practices, their ideas, their beliefs, and their philosophies, and to study them and learn them, and learn from them, and share with them also. So this is why I wanted to learn more about the ostrich and that particular bird. You know, living in an urban environment, you don't see animals in their original state, in their original nature, but it is something about the ostrich bird that influenced ancient and modern Africans to uphold the bird in high esteem for some reason. And it has not changed all over the region today. People and groups and kingdoms, they still have the utmost respect for the ostrich. So I wanted to study uh, an ostrich. You have to, otherwise there's no way to contextualize how they view it and why this that feather represents the highest individuals in the society, whether they are pharaohs, kings, chiefs, heroes, elders, uh, the highest respected people in a the society, they're wearing the ostrich feather. And so the ostrich is a very humble bird, is what they say, you know, group by group, it's a tall bird. Yes, we know the males, this is a male ostrich, you know, it's a black uh, feathers here, but the ostrich, uh, the males are larger, you know, seven to nine feet, over 300 pounds, a very big bird. And the uh, female ostriches are smaller, they're five to six feet, but the ostrich is one of the only birds that does not fly. It's a land animal that can generate some pretty good speed. And that ostrich can, can run with the best of them. You know, the ostrich could, could run over 40 miles an hour, you know, or 70 um, um, uh, kilometers an hour. 
and it's a really huge bird, large bird that can live up to maybe 50 years. And the people see that, they observe that, and they know that about the ostrich. So as I interview different uh, elders and others, uh, chiefs, that, that their ideas are similar about the ostrich, that they say it's a humble bird, that it's uh, a, a respectful bird, that the bird is not harmful, you know, that it's a graceful bird and they have so many things to say this polite bird according to them now i've seen an ostrich chase down some western tourists who got too close with their camera and was harassing the bird and the bird continued to chase down and peck away and attack the uh the people on that jeep who went into the bird's territory so i'm taking the shot from maybe 20 feet away didn't want to get too close the ostrich uh, kind of kept me in sight but kept his distance and i wanted to get a good shot but interesting bird and the, and the ostrich sheds a lot of feathers. So that's one of the things that was, um, that I noted. So I have a, a number of ostrich feathers. And one other thing that they all say, the groups one by one, they all say that they love the ostrich feathers because they're enduring. You know, they don't decay, they don't crumble, they don't fall apart and they're right. You know, I've had, I have ostrich feathers in different places and uh, regardless of the temperature or the environment, they are in pristine state. And so that is for sure that they know that. And so you have an ostrich feather and then the egg. You know, all parts of the ostriches are important, but I wanted to know why that bird? Because uh, the, the fact is there's different kinds of birds. There's storks, there's eagles, but why the ostrich? And that's why it was very important to try to figure out what is it that they understand about the ostrich today that helps drive their rituals and their ceremonies. And then, you know, how does that, for me as a researcher, relate to the past? And you can see it gives you a window into the past when they're explaining the details. So here, among the hammer in Ethiopia, uh, one of the many groups that I've spent time with on multiple occasions, and uh, these are some of, this is the elder here, elder of uh, the chief. This is Chief Baidi, and this is another elder here on the right. This is my guide of, of love, Ode, the student. He's He's always helpful and insightful, but you have two elders. And if you look at the chief here, notice that he has the ostrich feather and part of the kind of the plumes of the feather right there. And this elder here, he also has an ostrich uh, feather. You can't see it as well, but it's there, representing their status within the society of the hammer. And it's like group by group, there's the utmost respect for this particular bird, far and behind, far and um, beyond all of the other birds and the respects that they have. So we're able to spend time in a local village, you know, stay overnight to learn about the people and the customs and not, you know, rush, but to spend time. And then, you know, the next morning after drinking tea and, and, and eating just a little bit, we were able to interview the hammer chief, Baidi, and he's explaining the ostrich and the fundamental characteristics of the ostrich. He's also explaining about the leopard and why the leopard is important and special and why a hero is somebody that they elevate to the highest level of, the, of society who was able to wear the ostrich feather or the leopard skin. It's only certain individuals. And he's explaining those details uh, of exactly how the hammer uh, approach these uh, these items, the leopard skin and also the, the feather of the special bird that does not fly. And the ostrich is an African bird. And we know that it is indigenous to the area, but it's, and the people have always elevated that ostrich to high status because of the humbleness as they indicate and the specialness of the bird. And you see it, you see it, uh, going back to Kemet, as I showed you as well, with the highest possible law, the law of Ma'at. And they didn't choose the bird out of just guessing, but it's careful observation and interaction as well. And the hammer is one of those groups that maintain their culture. Yes, they do. The hammer don't care about any other group. They really don't. They're hospitable. They uh, come from a great culture that they have the utmost respect for. You see some of the hammer uh, jewelry, the hammer colors. This is how they dress. This is how they present the males, the females, uh, the women. It's uh, respectful. So Ode, this is his father to the, to the left. And then we have um, 
This man here, uh, uh, his name is Algo. Algo, you notice that he has the, there it is. It's the ostrich part of that ostrich feather here. And he is, if you all recall, in part two, I was showing Damu. I was showing Damu, the young, the young, the young brother who had to jump a series of bulls as a part of the extensive and elaborate and absolutely uh, um, stunning for many people part of the uh, part of the marriage process where he has to jump a series of bulls. Well, anyway, Damu, this is his uncle here, his uncle Algo, and he is a respected member among the the Hammer. And I was interviewing the elders again to learn more about their understanding of the leopard and the ostrich and what special place that it has. And it's amazing that the hammer don't care anything about anybody else. They really don't forget their ideas, their views, their beliefs, absolutely similar to, um, to the other groups. And uh, here, um, this, is my, uh, this is my guide here. Andu Alam, and so without him, I would not be able to go into these rural areas, isolated areas, and gain insight and gain access to the most important people. So it's only because we have uh, their respect, and so they open up and they share. And they really, when I go in, they see me as a family member. So I owe a lot of that to Andu Alam, Andu Alam, my my. Uh, able guide as we go into these rural areas, these really remote areas that take hours and hours to get to these locations. And so here we at the market. Um, and at the marketplace here, uh, the Temeca market is important because you see people from all around. And literally people will walk four hours or more each way just to get to the market to share their wares or buy items for the family in the village and the marketplace is just as important to learn. And so here you have a lot of hammer women and uh, they have the distinctive hammer hairstyle. And you know that they respect and have the utmost pride in their culture because, because of how they, they keep themselves up. You know, it's a distinctive hammer look. And so you've got the, the women here with the distinctive ha hammer braided hair and uh, it has this, this reddish tinge to it because you can see here, here's the red ochre. And the red ochre, this goes all the way back to classical Africa, using red ochre in the, the cultural daily life uh, um, practices. So they use this red ochre in their hair and that's what gives it that red, that reddish tinge, reddish color. So you have a lot of different hammer that come from different areas from miles and miles away. And, um, and you have subgroups among them. But mm -hmm. it's the ochre that you see here, which is an old traditional ancient practice that continues You see it. You can buy it in the marketplace, but it's the ochre mixed with butter. And you can see the hammer um, woman here. And anyway, they're the butter. So when the ochre is mixed with butter, that's what gives it this beautiful appearance that you see here. Here you have the older woman on the left. And so it's the ochre, it's the butter. She's married because of the hairstyle. And her jewelry would also represent her status in the family. And on the right, you have a younger woman. The reason why her braids are not longer because she's recently married, she's younger. So in the very near future, she too would have the hair that would be braided down as well. But everybody, all the women, very well groomed. And this is a uh, use of ochre and butter. I've always been uh, wanting to know about ochre. When I started learning about the culture in classical Kemet more, you know, 30 years ago, actually it was more than that, 35 years ago, I was very intrigued by it because of why, you know, red ochre, what is it? And so you see the practice still continuing. And these people are linking us to the distant past of ancient Kush, and you see the practices continuing. You can see it most notably in the art in Kemet as well. Now, you know, when you're in the marketplace, it's not just being there as a tourist and, and looking from afar, but you really learn the culture when you're interacting with the people. And uh, I feel at home and the people treat me at home. So here we're having a light moment. And one of the sisters, you see some of her statues there on the left 
and uh, we were joking <laughs> there. So uh, this is uh, this is why people are, are comfortable and they come around us, they stay around us, and there's a cultural exchange as opposed to, you know, as some people just come in as an outsider and they are treated as an outsider. But for me, it's been quite different and I'm glad that that we have, uh, that I have a great guide, but also that my vocation allows me to be able to be among the people. This is my vocation and not an occupation. And I think the people can recognize that, uh, you know, I'm part of their tradition as well. So that's what we're doing here. Now, another group, just to give you some snapshots to really link all of this to ancient Kush is the console. The console, very important group. They, uh, they're a special group. They're like the hammer and others. They maintain their culture and, uh, you know, their console. And they live in, uh, in the highland areas, in terrace type areas, because when the foreigners, when the Italians came in in the 1930s and tried to take over Ethiopia, they were not successful. Ethiopia was never colonized. But when the Italians were there for the five years, they um, caused havoc in the Kansu they, uh, to defend themselves. They uh, went to higher ground. So they live in the highland areas. I mean, really, really high up. And um, so it takes a long time to get to these areas. But that's what allows them to stay consul. They're not integrated and mixing and becoming some other group. They maintain their culture. So for me, this is crucial because the current practices, the theories, I mean, the, you know, the philosophy, the ideas, the understanding of, of, uh, of the creator and creation and their customary laws and traditions, they stay intact. And so uh, there was different guides that uh, I've worked with among the console to learn about the, uh, the traditional structure, the living pattern among the, uh, the console. So it is a world heritage site as well, the console. It's UNESCO World Heritage Site, and there are nine different clans and over 300 consul. And one of the things that intrigued me among many about the consul is the central house in all of the consul villages and the many different villages. Remember, there's nine different um, tribes. There's, there's about three dozen, a little less than three dozen villages, or about three dozen villages uh, uh, and nine uh, clans. But the Mora is the central house. This is the men's house. This is where the men hang out. This is where they talk. This is where they counsel. But also at the Mora, the boys from about the age of 11 or 12, they typically go and sleep in the Mora every night. So it's the, the Mora is a place where it's really uh, a place where um, it's, it's there. It's the, it's the council way of, uh, of, of, um, of, uh, of, um, uh, contraception. So in other words, um, you know, when, when young guys get to a certain age, they can easily slip out of the house when, you know, when the parents are not, not, uh, not paying attention and have relations with the young ladies, but not when they're in the mora. So they must stay there in the mora, and that's part of the, the, uh, the community rules. And so it's a part of contraception in order to keep those boys there. They stay in the mora and sleep there until they become married. But more than that, it being a very central and important house, is on the top of, of the Moras are, or is the ostrich egg. How about that? The most important, literally, the most important house in the Consul village has at the top of it an ostrich egg to indicate the importance of that bird. And the, the Consul they agree that there's something special about the ostrich and this is how they present it as well. So it's not an accident that they all, one group after another has such elevated views of the same bird. And it goes back to antiquity, but obviously it continues with the living cultures. And so in the, the Mora area, there's like a, a, a courtyard. And in that courtyard area, there's a generation pole. And one of the things that's distinctive um, about the, the Kansu, and this actually is very similar to the Oromo. And uh, so they're really linked to a very large degree to the Oromo, but the Kansu, they, um, they have a distinctive identity. And so they, in their age grade system, the Kata system, they rule for 18 years, 18. It's a, so it's 18 rules of each age grade. 
And so when, when an age grade rules among the, the consul, then there's a pole, there's a wooden pole put there um, as one group replaces another. So if you take a look at the a close up of the, uh, the generation pole, you see the first wooden, the, the smallest kind of wooden pole here, a post, it's the smallest one because that's the group that just began to rule. Then you see that the group ruling before the current rulership group, that stick is larger, has been there longer. And you can see the uh, progressive sizes of the sticks indicating one generational rule replaced by another. And that's how they have a system of, uh, of peaceful transfer of power from one group to the next. And it's all in 18, uh, 18 years successive increments of one group ruling and then you got the next group that comes in and there's an elaborate ceremony involved in the um, in the age grade system of rulership among the kunsu very highly organized system of rulership and their whole respect for the role of each group is is amazing so you have this uh the generation polls but also it, as a part of this elaborate ceremony for one age grade to replace the next, there's this huge stone. It's kind of a victory stone when you have the new group coming in to now govern the society. They've now reached enough influence and wisdom that they can effectively govern. Then this victory stone here, which is a huge, a huge granite ball. And this has to be carried and held during the entire uh, ceremony, during the age grade transition. So I said, let me try this because it's a huge, uh, and you're talking about solid granite. So I said, let me try this. And, uh, you know, it's still early morning, but I said, ah, I think I got this, but this thing is absolutely heavy. Try picking up a granite ball. It ain't easy, but I recognize as I was picking this up, uh, there were elder women who were around taking a look here. And so I said, okay, I got to do this. <laughs> so I was able to get it up. But the goal is you want to have it on your shoulder and it must be carried during the entire time. And so I did well enough to get probably a B, you know, maybe a B minus, but the women gave me an ovation. So, so they were, uh, they were pleased that I came in and, and, and I held it down. And so here it is that you had the console women there doing some, uh, some weaving here. And you see one of the, uh, one of the structures in the back, and this is elevated area too. So, but this is uh, the console women and uh, weaving, and then here they are with the children as well. And this is kind of in the courtyard area. They were looking at me with this huge ball, uh, granite ball. But the con the console are also known just to give you some insight of how important this is to really link to past traditions in the area and about the, the whole regional understanding about the Kushite traditions. Uh, again, everybody's not identical, they're not the same. They're distinctive, but there's an overriding and under, an underpinning unity there. So the Waka posts, these posts are made for, basically for chiefs and for, uh, for heroes. These are the two groups, and this is like a totem pole. And you have these posts where you have the, uh, these important individuals. So it would be the chief and, you know, his wife uh, would be there as well as, uh, you know, any hero. Someone has done a, uh, a great feat, something very special. And this looks like one of the weapons that the chief uh, would have used maybe to, you know, uh, get a wild, kill a wild animal or some enemy who was attacking the livelihood of the Kansu. But these are important. These walk up posts are very significant. And a lot of times you see these right when you're walking uh, into the village environment. And one thing that makes the, the um, console special and UNESCO points out that these are walled cities or walled towns. It, again, remember they moved to the highlands in the 1930s to, uh, to be out of the way of the, the fighting and warfare that went on that um, threatened the country, even though Ethiopia was successful pushing out and kicking back the Italians, but the, the council moved to higher ground. And when you look at these, um, so you have the walled, the walled uh, towns, but you have these big waka 
images. And these are the most important members of the society. And speaking of chiefs among the consul in their system. So it's an important age grade system, but also the rituals and ceremonies related to uh, the chief. So when the chief dies or passes away, they have a whole uh, ritual in place. They have a whole um, ceremony that's laid out so that this ceremony for the king, for the chief who has passed away, it's a ceremony that, you know, it's nine months, it's uh, nine days, nine hours, and even nine minutes, and then they bury the king. And so when it gets to nine days, um, that's when the village, that's when the community is made, the whole, all of the village, that's the village, that's when they made aware that the king has passed. So they don't announce it nine months out. They just obviously don't see the king, but at nine days is when they make the announcement. And then the king is mummified, the, the chief. He's mummified. And in the mummification uh, process, they take out the brains, the stomach, but they also take out the eyes of the individual uh, chief during mummification and they replace the eyes with the ostrich egg of their ruler who's passed on. So these traditions are very intriguing and interesting and insightful and they um, and these are living cultures and that's why it's special to be among the Kanso and the other groups to continue to learn about their traditions. Another group and this is just highlights to show you this. Actually, let me go back one second here about the, the Kansu to show you how their system works. The Kansu uh, and their link to ancient Kush, this is how they actually name some of the children. So if it's older, the older son, the name is Kuta. And then the sons that come after the oldest sons, Notice these names that are variations of the name Kush itself. The name for younger sons will be Kusi, Kusia, and Kusio. Variations of Kush. And these are a Kushitic people, the, the Kanso are. And then our same thing for on the on the female side. So for the eldest daughter, the name is Kuye. And then the younger daughter is Koye. So here it is, you have in the naming of the sons and daughters, a link to the name Kush. So this requires, obviously, the ongoing investigation and field work and link from the present to the past to know more about this whole naming tradition and how the practices of the Kansol relate to ancient Kush. And the naming of the children is one example. Now, the Walaita, very uh, proud people. And here's an image of the Cultural and Historical Museum. The Walaita, they're proud of their culture and heritage. They're more um, being challenged than the other groups because they live in urban areas. Anytime a group lives in towns and cities, then they're going to lose their culture. And that's what's happening at, at, a, at a quick and fast rate among the Walaita. And there are elders and older people who have issues with it because they can see the people don't know and don't really have much of a concern about the older like the culture, even though the elements are there. But anytime you have urban environments involved, then there's always going to be a separation from the past. And that's one of the losses in any place. It's not just Ethiopia. You go anywhere in the world and that's the case. So it's always about the rural areas, the isolated areas, the, the villages, and those those encampments that still people have the same ideas, traditions, and beliefs and uh, practices that um, have not been influenced. That's where you have to go. Or I'm somebody that loves the museum. So here's the actual picture of the uh, historical museum of the Walaita. So we're able to spend time. And this is just one area of the, of the museum. We can see authentic artifacts, such as, for example, these are, um, these are uh, original uh, chairs here for people to obviously sit down. Here are different uh, spears and different weapons. And then in the cases, you have uh, stools, headrests, different kind of vessels, gourds, other daily life items. You see them uh, in the cases there. And then also, if you look behind the seats here, there are musical string instruments 
as you see here, original, and uh, even a drum, and many different uh, items and objects related to rituals, ceremonies, as well as their day-to-day -day life. So it's all very insightful and instructional. Now, uh, in addition to the ostrich and the ostrich feather, I mentioned earlier about the leopard. Well, the leopard in the area also is the other animal and it has the utmost respect of all the groups in the area. And here you have an image of a priest from ancient Kemet, thousands of years old. We know the man's a priest, not only because of the shaven head, but because he has a leopard skin outfit. And only as the people say today, only a hero or a chief or a king or someone who has the highest status, a special warrior, or someone who's done a special deed in behalf of the people can wear the leopard skin outfit. And there's something special about the leopard. And I wanted to know why this animal, you have many animals around. You know, it can't just be the, the leopard spots because hyena also have pattern on their, their skin. So what is it about the leopard? You've got hyenas in the area, you have lions in the area, but it's the leopard in ancient and modern times. So this is why I also wanted to go to the region to continue to do the primary research. And in the Walaita Museum, they do have leopard skin, and they too have the utmost respect for the leopard about how this is a stealth animal. It's hard to find a leopard. It's hard to track a leopard. You have to have tracking, you have to have a tracking team, and it may take three, four days or a week to even try to come um, upon the leopard or even really successfully follow the tracks. So let's be clear. It's not like people are going around killing leopards. No one's going to be that effective because it's very, it's a stealth animal and very savvy, very strong animal. And because of its strength, its stealth and savviness, the leopard is respected much more than the other uh, cats and other animals. And so only the highest members of a society can wear the leopard skin outfit in important ceremonies. Maybe it's a funeral, maybe it's a marriage or any other kind of special ceremony worn by only the highest members of the society. And this is how it was in classical Kemet. The only people you see wearing the leopard skin outfit was the, the, the king or the pharaoh and a, and a high priest. Those are the ones that typically are priests performing an important ceremony wears a leopard skin outfit and that's how it is today that's all it's just the the, the hero it's the the chief of a special ceremony and so the leopard and someone asked to address this question someone asked on um, what the part two what about the lion no they don't see the lion the same way because first of all this is lion skin on the right first of all the lion is uh, obviously is uh is 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 very smart very wise and um, and uh, and very difficult to be able to, to capture or, or kill very much. So they're not out going out killing the animals. That's not what they do. But when they do happen to come across these powerful animals, they have much more respect for the leopard. And the reason why, um, you know, the the coat, they love the the image or the color of the coat. Plus, it is the the nature of the leopard too. So, like some groups, they don't like the lions. I know the Morsi indicated this that they don't like lions because the lion killed their cattle. So they have issues with lions. Plus, the coat is just plain as a, compared to the leopard. But the leopard is special in all of the cultures, ancient and modern. And um, and the leopard. So it's not just the color of the coat, because again, the cheetah has spots as well. But they're dealing with the fundamental nature of a leopard. For example. And the lions have this in common too. If you put food out, you just put out meat. The lions not the leopard's not going to just go and eat. They're more stealth. They're wiser than that. They will check out the surroundings, as if it might be a trap. <laughs> and the leopard will go in and be very methodical about going to to finally uh, eat meat if it's put out and if it's out there. Whereas that's not how the hyena operate. The hyena doesn't care. The hyena jumps in runs in, eats the meat, and that could be a trap. It could be danger all around. And they understand and see that. That is a different understanding that the leopard has than the hyena, for example. So to answer the question that someone mentioned, no, they don't see lions the same way at all. They have more respect for the leopard. And that's a region-wide uh, understanding, both ancient and also modern. 
Now going even further south to Uganda, we see similar ideas, similar practices. So we'll probably have to adjust our map even more as we look at this common uh, cultural unity that links these different groups in the Nile Valley. So going to Uganda, I found out in 19, and um, it was 2004, that when I went to, uh, to Toronto, I found out about the, in Uganda, I found out about the Kingdom of Buganda and their paraphernalia associated with the king. And so um, the Kingdom of Buganda, very special. This is the flag of the Kingdom of Buganda. So it's a large area in Uganda and it's the living kingship that drew my attention to the area of 16 years ago. And so Bu the Buganda kingship is absolutely special. And UNESCO has marked the uh, Kusibi tombs as a world heritage site, where these are the kings of, uh, the tombs of kings, the Bugandan kings that go back uh, seven centuries. And so uh, here's the main interest to the Kusibi tombs. And one thing about the area here is that the items are made out of uh, organic material, not granite and hard stone. So we don't find a lot of artifacts in the area, but uh, we do find some, and there are some, but not the enduring stone that you would see in the, the northern part of the Nile Valley. But what we do have is the list of kings from the, uh, the, the kingdom of, the, of Buganda. And this goes back to Kato Kentu. Kato Kentu is the first of the, the kings of the Buganda, and the title is Kabaka. So from Kato Kentu in the late 13th century to the modern king, it's an unbroken tradition of the kings of Buganda. In other words, the Kabaka. They have and use the same paraphernalia, the same imagery to represent kingship in high status. And this is why I was so intrigued by the tradition among the Buganda. Here it is, you got uh, the Kabaka, Ronald Mwenda Mutebi II. So Mutebi, he's, he's been the king for uh, quite some time, since 1993. So he's the 36th in the list and line of rulers over the 700 year period. And what's important about this king, he's still the king now today, is that you can see he is wearing the ostrich feather. We're talking 21st century is still the same tradition in modern day Buganda that goes back quite some ways. And so it's the same thing. Why the ostrich feather? There's many other birds around, but there's something special about the ostrich. Also in the, uh, the, uh, the tomb area here, you have uh, again, a shield representing the Buganda flag colors and different shields, there's different spears related to uh, these kings. There's images of each king and some of the items associated with them. Look how well made this shield is. A very, uh, you know, shield very beautiful, as you can see, very well made. But um, so these objects survive, but <clears throat> not everything. But they too have the utmost respect for, again, it's the leopard. So inside of the Kasubi tomb, you have this, um, this leopard here and again, it's very difficult to track and kill a leopard. So no one's going around just slaughtering leopards. They don't have that mentality like the West does. You got somebody in the West, you know, in America, for example, they'll just kill animals and put stuff them and put them on display uh, just for sport. And that's it. Africans have never looked at it that way, have never done it that way. But what we do see is the Kabaka Mutebi II wearing what? The leopard skin outfit in his coronation ceremony. So he wears all the paraphernalia of what the Kabaka have done all along. So again, it's the regional understanding and philosophy and practices, one group after another, whether they know each other's tradition well or not, you see that there's a common understanding. And you have no idea of how many animals and other uh, are, are in the area as for them to hone in on just a couple, you know, and you see all of these different animals along the way and plants and these, they know their environment uh, intimately, but they have the same understanding of the uh, animals, 
which is very significant. And that's why I've been out in the field. So what's urgent now as I close, the urgent field work that has to continue as I pursue a deep understanding of um, Kushology and the origins of the ancient Kushite civilization, the field work is very urgent. So I'm gonna close with showing you why this is an urgent issue. And the work must be done now is that in Ethiopia, for example, the Omo River. So the area that I've been showing you in Ethiopia is the Omo River Valley. And I'd share with you on, on a previous um, uh, part two, uh, sharing with you when I, you know, you go into the Omo Valley. So once you get to a place called Jinka, then you are going south into the special region of the Omo Valley with these special groups that still maintain their cultural ways and their cultural tradition. But the Omo Valley, is facing uh, problems now. And this is the Omo River because of the series of dams that have been constructed. So Gabi 1, Gabi 2, and now Gabi 3. A huge dam project is um, it's stopping the overflow and the natural flow of the river. So the Omo River is what these groups in Ethiopia and even in, in Kenya, for example, uh, uh, indirectly in, Kem uh, in, in Kenya, but it's what these groups survive are because it's the river. The Omo River would overflow its banks and help irrigate the land. And these groups are able to be sedentary groups. They're not nomadic groups that travel from one place to another. No, these are settled groups. And the, uh, the ones that we, show, we showed you, the Desinage, we showed you the Hammer, we showed you the Morsi, all of these different groups in the area there is, uh, they rely on the Omo River. And the Omo, when it overflows its banks on an annual basis, on a regular basis, that allows them to farm, to irrigate their crops, to help to feed the, the community. But not only that, but the river is very important for the animals, for the cows and sheep to be able to, to drink. And with the Gabi 3 Dam, it has dammed up the Omo. And now the people are in, 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 in jeopardy of drought and hunger simply because the dams have been built to allegedly create hydroelectricity, but for who? It's at the expense of the traditional groups in the southern nationalities, uh, nation nationality and people's region in the southwest Ethiopian area. And the World Commission on Dam said that no dam should be built unless the local people agree and that they're part of the process. And this is, is preposterous because the Gebi 3, 1, 2, and 3, not only are the local people not a part of it, but they uh, have been protesting the whole process and the government wants to wipe these people out and move them out of the way. Take a look at this here, for example, here's the Omo. So the Omo, um, the Omo River here, it's flowing from the Northern area and you don't see it, but there's Gabby four is on the way and they want to build Gabby four, Gabby five, but here is the Omo and you have these traditional groups that depend on the water. Here's the Bodhi people. Here's the Kwaku people. They, they depend on the, the Omo. So the Omo is flowing in this direction and you have the big sugar corporations, sugar plantations. That's what, that's what the Ethiopian government is focused on. It's about sugar of all things, that they wanna use this, this traditional farmland of the people and put these big companies there in order to maximize profits. Then you have the Surma or the Suri, the Surma, are very uh, uh, very similar to the Morsi, but all these different groups there, depending on the Omo, which is flowing here in this direction, you see it. And here's the Morsi right there in, in, in the Mago National uh, Park, but the Omo is flowing in this direction. Then you have the Hammer, who I showed you, the Desinage, and the Omo River finally empties into Lake Turkana uh, after it crosses the border into Kenya. And there's people in Kenya also fighting and complaining and looking to keep their own way of life intact. So the friends of Lake Turkana, for example, are challenging this continuous damming up of the important Omo River because of the fact that the lake levels of, of, of Lake Turkana now has, has, uh, has receded. The lake levels are lower by about uh, a meter or two. I think it's about two meters now. And so the fishing, which is what the people in the Lake Turkana area rely on is not reliable anymore because of the lower lake levels. 
So the building of the dams is not only affecting the indigenous groups in the, in the southern nations, nationalities, and people's region of Ethiopia, but it's affecting the people in Kenya, in the northern part, uh, these indigenous groups here. And that's part of the problem. So the Gebi D3 dam has been absolutely destructive to their way of life. And by the way, it's more than one way to say or to write dam. So we're dealing with dam projects, and this is part of the challenge. And so it's urgent. A couple other things here as I close out is here's the Bana people. And um, the Bana are not like the hammer, whereby their culture is slipping away uh, much faster as the Ethiopian government wants to incorporate all these groups into a modern Ethiopia where they're not speaking their language anymore. They give up their certain practices regarding marriage and other customs. Well, the Bana, they're not like the hammer in keeping uh, all aspects of the culture together. And uh, this elder here on the left here, when we spoke with them, this is elder uh, Ikeyaro. And uh, Ikeyaro, he was telling me that his son had left the local village, he's gone to the city, and now his son has come back after he, he, he started practicing a new religion in the city, he's come back to his father and the Bana people trying to convert them. He wants them to change their, their religion, change their religious ideas and their philosophy, and, uh, and impose Christianity on them. And so uh, Ikearo was disappointed that his son would go out and, and adopt a foreign religion to try to change them. And he was happy that I had come and he was saying uh, in translation is that his son has left, but he's glad that I've come to help to try to preserve and promote the culture while his son wants to eliminate it. And so this is what's happening with some of the groups internally and not even the outside forces of the government that wants to push people off their land. So there is, a, and you all recall with part two, I had indicated that I went among the Bana and we went to a burial site of a king who had a, the grave marker was, a, was in the shape of an of a ostrich feather before it decayed and, and uh, deteriorated. Also is that along the way, there's an elder Geda Kuala Kansala. This elder, he is one of only five people that still speaks the Brahili language. One of just five that still speaks his language. And when we were on our way, we actually um, saw the elder. We stopped, interviewed him about the language here. And so he is only one of five. So I wanted to know, well, what happened? Why is there only five? He had indicated the the uh, disease has wiped out the people, but we're highly, just him and four other elders. And um, so to learn from the elder about his issues, his concerns, his language, we, uh, we had to use actually four languages. So the man on the right here, he has to help translate and uh, his name was uh, Admatsu. So Admatsu is translating. So uh, the elder Geda, he is from his, his native language is Burhaili, but he speaks a couple other languages in one language. So he's had to speak to Admatsu in the uh, in the Gwoda, in the Gwoda language, and then Amatsu then has to translate that into am hard so that my guide then can uh, translate and alam can translate from am hard to english so we actually we actually actually have four languages involved just to try to communicate with the elder Geda, who speaks for highly and when we went back to speak with them then uh, believe it or not this is amazing when the other elders found out that he had interviewed with with me then uh, they were not happy. They thought he collected a whole bunch of money and he didn't include them in the interview and with the sharing of the money when none of that took place. When we talked to him, we said we would be back and we did come back to speak with him further, but there were so many people in the village around that uh, the other people found out about it and they had some ideas that weren't anything to do with facts. But can you imagine that? 
we're here in the remote area trying to find out what we can do to help promote and preserve the Brahali language. And you got people thinking about uh, that somebody left them out. So jealousy can be any and everywhere. And that's even what happened here. And you know, Elder Gator was also concerned and unhappy that some couple foreigners had come in and uh, researchers and claimed that they were going to help to preserve the language and they didn't return. And this is what it concerned him. So the time is of the essence to continue to do the field work in the area. And so, uh, and then finally, I want to share with you that uh, the Morsi, the Morsi, very important group. I pointed them out in the Mago uh, National Park region. It takes a long time to get to the area. They're an isolated place, but the Morsi are pretty famous for their traditions. And this is the filmmaker, um, uh, um, Alusa Riley. And uh, Alusa, uh, 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 Alusa Riley, he is um, someone who is a Morsi, he's a Morsi icon, really, a Morsi gym, a Morsi spokesperson. He's a Morsi filmmaker. And some years ago, he went to Australia to learn English and also to learn how to use the camera as a, as a weapon to preserve the culture. Because um, one thing that they learn is um, foreigners come in and they have these cameras. And you know, now in the digital age, you can actually show the images as you take pictures. So the Morsi recognized and um, Alusa Riley recognize and, and the people recognize that we need to do this take control of our own preserving our own history and so he then was able to go to australia and learn how to speak english but also how to document the traditional ways of the morsi so his film is called shooting with morsi and he's had problems with the government you know they've taken his camera they put the, our brother in jail as well to try to <clears throat> to stop him from being in opposition to the government. And um, he's trying to preserve the Morsi culture and tradition. And the government has other plans. And this is why they've attacked um, our, our brother, who's a filmmaker. And you can see this film. You can probably see it on YouTube or some other, uh, some other venue. But this is what is happening in the region. So the field work is urgent to preserve, help to preserve the cultures. And, you know, one of the publications is Cultural Survival. that has been around for a while that documents a lot of these issues, not necessarily just on Africa, but around the world with the P re repatriation movement and just cultural survival in general. So that's just one publication that occasionally you will find some issues dealing with uh, indigenous African groups, but mainly, Af mainly groups from around the world and their attempt to survive. So that's what we wanted to, I wanted to share with you for part three on the classical African civilization of ancient Kush. And you can always go to my website, mainnewmpim.com or advancingtheresearch.org if you're interested in a book or any other materials. But this is part of the series on, uh, on Kushology. And this is part three. They have a part four as well. And that would um, likely, I might interview somebody in uh, part four to... Um, to talk more about this whole emerging field and emerging discipline of Kushology. So those are the main things I wanted to share with you in addition to what we have already presented before. So you get a much bigger picture of this important field and discipline of Kushology. And my greatest work will be coming out on the ongoing field work in Kushology and the whole region. So that will be coming out uh, in due time. But I wanted to just give you a small snap, snapshot. This is a small fraction of really the field work that I've been doing. So this is part three of uh, Kushology on Professor May New and Pim. So uh, stay connected and we will continue to, to advance the work of primary research. So we'll see you next time.